over in beautiful Charleston, South Carolina. A special inaugural live episode of the show. <laughs> Training tug of war. It's definitely nuanced. How do you balance all of that? I didn't see you getting trained, then you were not trained. We do have a lot of access to training. It's how we get them there. That's all. Okay, class, welcome to your cybersecurity training course. I know you've all been anxious to learn about this important subject. Please open your textbooks to chapter one. Now, there's a lot here, as you can see, and technically we should be starting on page 10. But I'm going to ask you to go ahead and jump to page 40. The chapter seems to end there. There's just a box. Yes, now class, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and please check the box. Uh, but we haven't read any of it. I understand. Now, if you will, let's please move on to chapter two. <clears throat> How's the class going? Fantastic. Everyone has... Oh, gosh. Looks like we have a major data breach. Really? Can I get a show of hands of which students can help? Mm. Oh. Hmm. I am... Jill Wilfong, Chief Marketing Officer for Corn Ferry and also the host of Corn Ferry's Briefings podcast, which is our deep dive into topics that corporate leaders need to care about. Today, we are on the road, a special inaugural live episode of the show. So thank you to all of you for being here today. Appreciate that. And we'll be taking your questions as we go. So hopefully we'll get some, uh, some of your thoughts as, as we go along here too. Uh, before we get started, a quick show of hands from all of you. We just saw this video on training. I want to know how many of you have ever taken a corporate training course. All right. Everybody's hand is raised, right, as, as you would imagine. So a, pre a pretty solid number. Now tell me this. How many of you, while taking that class, have thought, I might rather be doing something else? <laughs> and for those of you uh, listening and watching, also, all the hands are raised. Uh, so I have news for you. Uh, just like you're not alone in this room, you're not alone in this world. And at a time when having an AI-savvy workforce couldn't really be more critical, interesting that less than a quarter of employees said that they're using their company's AI skills training programs. It's not like companies aren't trying their absolute best as well. Right? So U.S. firms, just in the U.S., spent nearly $102 billion on training last year. 10% increase from two years prior. So today I am joined by three experts that we're going to talk to today to talk a little bit about corporate training. They're all in talent acquisition fields and deal a lot with not just identifying great talent, but bringing them into the organization and, and onboarding them. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what is going wrong, but also what's going right, because a lot of things at, at the firms that these uh, folks are attached to are doing some things that are, that are right, that we can all learn from. Uh, and, and we're calling this this training tug of war. So let me introduce our guests. We've got uh, first Jason Woods in the center, uh, Director of Talent Acquisition for the US and Canada at Honeywell. Next, we have Eileen Rivera. Hi, Eileen. Uh, Vice President of Global Ta Total Rewards and Talent Acquisition at Biogen. And then last but certainly not least, we've got uh, someone joining us from Corn Ferry, Iktamal Danishvar. She's our Vice President of uh, Recruitment Process Outsourcing, based out of EMEA, does a lot of work in the Middle East. So it'll be interesting to get not just kind of a US perspective, a global perspective, but also talk a little bit about a, a thriving emerging market in the Middle East and kind of, kind of what's happening there. Uh, very good to get all of your thoughts today, so thank you for joining us. Uh, let's start out, and we'll, we'll scroll up a little bit here. We're going to start with some questions, and, and Eileen, maybe the best thing to do is start with you. Talk a little bit about your uh, training programs today, kind of how do you address corporate development? Talk about what you're doing. 
my colleague and, and our teams, and, and really we talked about this a lot as our HR leadership team, said we kind of need to revamp this and, and rethink how we do this. Yeah. Um, and said, okay, we can probably meet 80 to 85% of what people need through um, some broad-based programs. And then brought a lot of our cohort programs, slimmed them down, brought them in-house um, so that we could be much more nimble with what are the topics that we need to be addressing yeah. um, you know, in the moment. Yeah. Um, we also got our leaders to be much more engaged in it. Mm -hmm. um, so not only were the people who were in those programs seeing our leaders, but they were hearing from them, what is that you know, how are the leaders thinking about this in order to be successful? Jason, I'm curious with you guys, are you finding the same thing? It feels like with a lot of us, we're trying to do so much. Um, this notion of kind of focusing on trying to do fewer things really well. Do you see that happening at Honeywell or is, is that maybe something unique to Biogen? We have an accelerator yeah. um, platform. That's where we kind of house all of our training and it helps um, our employees. A lot of them use individual development plans mm -hmm. um, or IDPs, what we call them. It's a really kind of course, you know, kind of pr make their course um, through how they want to grow their career yeah. um, within Honeywell. Um, and you, there's a wide variety of training um, available on the, on the accelerator. You punch it at 8.30 every morning, except you punch it at 7.30 following a business holiday. Plus it's a Monday, then you punch it at 8 o'clock. Punch it late, and they dock it. This goes to 7. Mr. Matuzak. Art. Incoming articles, get a voucher. Outgoing articles, provide a voucher. Move any article without a voucher, and they dock you. Take this off the secretarial pool on three. ASIP. Letter size of green down. voucher. Fulver size of yellow voucher. Partial size of maroon voucher. Hey, kid, this is for more to try. Chop, chop. Wrong color voucher, and they dock you. That is Academy Award winner Tim Robbins in the Hudsucker Proxy being trained or maybe more accurately being told what not to do so his, his pay doesn't get docked. The scene illustrates the point that even if you do have training and you manage to get people to show up, that training still has to be, Eileen, as you said, meaningful, right, And in order to be effective. Uh, one survey has only 12% of organizations fully grasping how their employees prefer to learn. And I imagine really surrounding that is a challenge in and of itself. Uh, Jason, I'm, I'm curious at Honeywell, what's been done to kind of surround the approach to training and, and, and try to customize that in a way that, that your employees really favor? The individual development plans really, it's kind of helps folks kind of Journey, make their journey, yeah. um, and and really um, directs them to you know to, to all different types of training because we do we do have a lot of access to training. It's how do we get them there, right? Yeah, um, interesting. So Iktimal, I'm curious. Is this, it's got to be a big challenge for companies. You, you're, yeah. We all do well by scale, right, and by having kind of consistency and, and a few things people can choose from. So you want some choice, but probably not too much choice. Uh, but then this is a world of agency where the more choice, the better, and, and yeah. people kind of know where they want to go and need the roadmap. But how do you balance all of that as, as members of bigger corporations? It is difficult to manage because, like my colleagues have rightfully said, people learn differently. Um, what we have seen, interestingly, is the introduction of podcasts as a, as a training method with some of our clients. Mm -hmm. So. Again, particularly with the more younger generation that actually want to listen um, as they're doing other activities or driving into work and not just sitting in the traditional online training course or face-to-face -face training course. Mm -hmm. um, and so companies have had to think differently about that. My name is Andy. Andrea, but uh, everybody calls me Andy. I need 10 or 15 skirts from Calvin Klein. Okay, what kind of skirts do you... Please bore someone else with your questions. And make sure we have Pier 59 at 8 a.m. tomorrow. And remind Jocelyn I need to see a few of those satchels that Mark is doing in the pony. And then tell Simone I'll take Jackie if Maggie isn't available. Did Demarchelier confirm? Demarchelier? Demarchelier? Did he get, get him on the phone? Uh, okay. And Emily? Yes? That's all. That is uh, obviously right. a scene out of the Devil Wears Prada, a very popular movie where an employee brand new to the company yeah. uh, in the world of fashion as well embarks on this difficult period of training under this icon, right? Uh, it does raise the question in my mind of whether it's better 
to hire somebody completely new for a role and train them, uh, or is it better to kind of take someone from within a company and, and shape and mold and, and kind of move them up the ranks? Uh, one study said that seven in 10 companies is expecting to kind of increase uh, their ability to kind of move people up through the company. So I think there's, there's a focus on that. Maybe Iktimal, we start with you. Where do you kind of fall on this, this balance of bringing in yeah. new people, developing people from within? Uh, how do you think about that? Can I say it's a mixture of both? <laughs> yeah, I think you can. I think you can. And I think it has to be. Look, I think when we talk about skills retention and life cycle, like the life cycle of skills, they don't last as long as they did before. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a continuous amount of upskilling and reskilling of your current employee base to keep them relevant. But there's going to be some new skills that you're going to have to bring into the organisation far quicker than it will take for you to train those people because it's an immediate need right. or it's a niche. I'm curious, Eileen, how much do you guys think about bringing in talent from within your industry versus just completely going outside your space, right? This notion of kind of cross-pollination and taking people from other industries and bringing them in to really give you a fresh perspective. Is that something that that you see people focusing on? That I think is really role dependent. Okay. I mean, technology is one of them, right? Yeah. I mean, bringing people in from the Googles and the Microsofts to you know, a, a biotechnology company, mm -hmm. is, there's some really beneficial things you can learn from that. Mm -hmm. um, particularly when we think about you know, analytics and, and a number of different areas, even thinking about how do you speed up research and development. But I can't bring somebody in to do that, you know, who I need, where I need a PhD right, for you right. know a certain role or an MD or, or or whatnot. And that's probably a good note, right? <laughs> Just to be really open, be in touch with our people, and 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 really kind of sort it out as we go. Mm. Uh, questions from the audience. You've all been sitting here for a while with us. Uh, you're all dealing with the same kind of learning and development and onboarding issues. Anything on your minds that we can we can talk about? So the question that's kind of weighing on my mind is the credibility of the bot. Right. So if you think about leadership development training, if you think about subject matter experts, people who have PhDs, who are the trainers, who are, you know, kind of teaching the individual who's on the other end, will it ever replace, like, you know, the, the individual who's got years and years of experience as opposed to a robot who's basically just, because when you use chat GPT and different things like that, you still have to fact check and you still have to kind of apply your own kind of um, checking to the information that you're receiving. Where do you see that falling in as far as the, you know, the learner actually taking it seriously and giving it the credibility that somebody who has the subject matter expertise would have? I think it still has a way to mature, right? So it's yeah. as we're having to feed it, um, that's how it learns. Um, just like we do, we learn the same way, right? But, um, you know, I think uh, it's this, Technology is emerging, and it, or it's it's and it's it's going to continue to change. So that's going to that's I think really where we where we have to be. It's very immature right now. The tools can inherently take a lot of data and spit back out to you something quicker than most humans can. Um, and so from that standpoint, I think there's a level of credibility to the to the data um, that that's pretty robust, and that I think for the most part, to your point, we still have to fact check, but you know it feels pretty reliable. But it's never going to be able to stand up and say, well, when I was in this situation, um, this is what happened and this is what I learned from it. Um, and that's the piece that I think, I don't know how that will ever get built into it. Iktimal, I'm going to end with you. So okay. as you're dealing with uh, various companies and kind of guiding and, and steering them, um, what's your advice on, on this space? Do you, do you jump in? Do you hold back? What do you, what do, you do? I think if you don't jump in, you're going to be behind the curve, so you, you have to embrace it. Yeah, I love it. Thank you all for being here and sharing your perspectives. I uh, really appreciate it. For those of you watching or listening to our podcast online, be sure to stick around for This Week in Leadership. And bye for now from Charleston. Hi, and welcome to This Week in Leadership. I'm Rupak Bhattacharya, and here's a quick look at what else is happening in business. More sick days. 
The average number of sick days taken has grown 15% in five years, an increase that cuts both ways. On the one hand, it reflects the fact that employees are making better work-life balance decisions, but on the other, it represents a threat to corporate productivity, which may rely on people not using all of their sick time. How to deal with your enemies at work. Six in 10 employees admit to having a work nemesis. Experts say that while healthy rivalry can motivate employees to excel, it can often devolve into something worse. Instead, they encourage professionals to focus on elevating their own game and even consider collaborating with their supposed foe. What if we let AI do the thinking? With 20% of large companies investing up to $50 million per year in AI, technology professionals say a day may soon come where AI starts making major strategic decisions. The challenge, they say, will be for firms to maintain stakeholder trust at a time when just 67% of employees and 30% of customers trust a given company. For more insights on business and leadership, head to cornfairy.com slash insights. The executive producer of Briefings is Jonathan Dahl. Today's episode was produced by Rupak Bhattacharya, Nadira Putri, and Teresa Allen, and it was edited by Jaron Henry McRae. It contains reporting by Russell Perlman, Ariane Cohen, and Peter Loria. Our video segment contains original artwork by Fraser Milton, Haley Kennel, Jonathan Pink, and Sasha Kotschik. Don't forget to read our magazine, available at newsstands and at cornfairy.com slash briefings. That's it for Corn Fairy Briefings. I'm Jill Wiltfong. See you next time. And so what we've been seeing in the Middle East in particular is a 360 degree change to how they treat learning and development. So it's been a change in policy. Sometimes we make commitments, but it's hard to actually see impact.